my journey to becoming an on-state path started um, when I was in graduate school, I suppose, or right after graduate school. I had went to undergraduate school for chemistry and biology, which is essentially a pre-medicine curriculum. But I really didn't, in my heart, want to be a doctor as I understood doctors to be. I didn't want to be the prescription writing, needle injecting type of person that uh, would see patients every couple minutes and move along. I had experience with that as a child. My mom was a nurse and uh, they had kind of in their head for me to be a doctor. But it's not really something that I had in my heart to do. I was more of a health and fitness and exercise type of person. So I ended up getting an internship at Temple University and I worked in their biokinetics research lab and that got me interested in exercise physiology. They offered for me to do a research assistantship and a teaching assistantship there should I not want to try to get into medical school. So I took that, ended up getting a master's degree in exercise um, physiology. Then I worked as a personal trainer for a while and I liked using my hands and I found out about a massage school that was in Philadelphia. So I enrolled and took uh, massage therapy classes and I really enjoyed that. And I was working in physical therapy offices, uh, working with manual therapy, and I was doing exercise prescription for people for rehabilitation. And I got involved because of my health and fitness thing, I got involved with the Philadelphia Dragon Boat team. A dragon Boat's a long boat where you compete either paddle on the right side or left side or whatever. But the bottom line is with that is that there were several people on that team who were upperclassmen at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and having conversations with them about what my interests were and what I like to do, they kind of asked me to consider looking into the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine because I could, if I wanted to, they said, pursue hands-on medicine. I could be a manual medicine practitioner. They informed me that very few people actually did that, but if you really wanted to do it, it, it could be done. At the same time, I had another friend who I went to Temple with, his wife had just recently been accepted and had completed her first year at the Philadelphia College, and he encouraged me also to apply there and to enroll. He said it'd be perfect to do the hands-on work. So I had a whole bunch of people at the same time in my life telling me I should really look into this osteopathic medicine thing and that I might be able to f find my passion there. So I, I did, I explored it, and I found out that you could, in fact, do manipulation as like your major emphasis and your major specialty, although very few people did it, they said that you, you could do it. So that's how I ended up getting into Philadelphia College of Hospital Medicine. I, I found out about it, I enrolled in it, and then when I got there, I went right away to the faculty and said, look, I want to do the hands-on work. What do I got to do? And they said, well, go to classes, come to things that are after school, and all the opportunities that exist for people that are interested. So I joined all those organizations and I, I did all those things. And when I was there, they started a fellowship program that had not previously existed at the school. And it was designed for people like myself who were really, really interested in the hands-on work. So it was me and one other person were the first two in the fellowship program. It started the year that I was eligible to do it. So that added an extra year onto my training and education, doing clinical work, doing teaching in the laboratories, that type of thing. I graduated, did an internship, and then I came back to PCM and I worked as faculty in the OMM department, that's Osteopathic Medical Medicine Department. And I worked there for a few years, left there, private practice, and I got involved with teaching um, in Canada, and had done that for, for many, many years, and had a private practice at the same time. So that, that's kind of my journey into the world of Osteopathic Medical Medicine. that in the United States, which is where osteopathy began, and keep in mind it began as a manual medicine um, assessment and treatment methodology to act as a, either a replacement for the medicine that was being practiced out of the day, or as a separate system. It was designed to be its own healthcare system uh, that was holistic in mind and would work on the structure function relationships, work on dietetics, things like that. It was designed to be a replacement for the medicine of the day that was being practiced. And in the United States, which is where it originated, for various reasons politically and professionally over the years, it had become less and less and less hands-on and more and more and more medical-like to the point now where there, I think there's been resolutions with the American Osteopathic Association where they really don't want people who are osteopathic medicine physicians, DOs and stuff, to call themselves or refer to themselves as osteopaths. 
They want them that to be an archaic term that's only used in passing to differentiate what's going on in the USA versus what's going on in the rest of the world. So osteopathic medicine, or a DO, doctor of osteopathic medicine, is very different now than what you would have in Europe or Australia, you know, England, any places where they're non-physician um, manual practitioners. The reality is, is that very, very few American DOs, medically trained, osteopathic medically trained DOs, will actually use hands-on assessment and treatment as their primary focus of practice. Most DOs practice in all the fields of medicine that you would expect an MD to practice in, and oftentimes they practice almost identical to where you wouldn't know the difference. In Europe, other countries, osteopaths are known to be manual practitioners, where the only way they would have been a physician if they had done some sort of medical school training somewhere else before that, and then pursued osteopathic training. So they're very, very different uh, beasts at this point. One is a medically kind of trained component, that's the US, and outside the US, unless they were already a physician, they're not medically trained, they're trained in manual technique, trained in manual application of, of treatment. In my opinion, the classical osteopathy is as close to the original osteopathy as you're going to find in existence. Uh, my experience has been that in the US, like I said, it's been replaced by medicine. And although there are some good osteopathic manual medicine physicians out there, very few of them are using what I would consider classical osteopathic applications. Many of them have specialized in particular technique applications or technique styles and don't necessarily work in the complete manner that an early osteopath might have. That's not to say there aren't any, but there's really very, very few. My experience has been outside of the um, US and Canada, Europe, Australia, places like that where it's manual practice, in places where it's become regulated by the country, that they've been pigeonholed into a uh, musculoskeletal box where they've removed a lot of the potential potency of the traditional or classical osteopathic met methods for helping people who have disease processes and such like that, where that's been deemed out of their scope of practice. So as a result, they're basically kind of delegated or relegated to working with people who have neck pain, back pain, aches, pains, sprains, strains, that kind of a thing. It's really been more of a musculoskeletal kind of emphasis rather than a whole body healthcare emphasis. When I saw what Mr. Warnham was doing, I was, I was really very pleasantly surprised because I had kind of been developing my thought and my way of treatment over the years by some of the um, influences and teachers that I had, some of the older DOs that I had contact with who had graduated in the like, earlier years, 1936, 1940, things like that. And some of the elements that I had picked up from them and I had discovered that were very useful from that whole body kind of approach when I came to Maidstone and met Mr. Warnham, he was, like, we were on the same page. What he was saying, what he was doing, like, was right there, and I was right there with it. And he, with the body adjustment, helped me put it all together faster, I think, than I would have been able to put it together on my own. He kind of jumped me ahead in time as far as where I was developmentally from an assessment and a treatment standpoint. And I think the body adjustment is a fantastic tool and a template to, can be used either by itself or as we were doing kind of this week to show how all the other types of techniques that have been developed and worked on over time by other practitioners, how that can really be incorporated into the body adjustment appropriately to help the effectiveness and efficiency of the practitioner if they understand how to use and apply those manual tools in the manner that they were really most effective and, and designed to be used. Okay. Osteopathy in the future is very precarious. And the reason I would say that is because the more it gets regulated, and I'm not talking necessarily about self-regulation, but I'm talking about government regulation. In any places where, place where osteopathy has been taken over by a government body, it has been basically honed down to a musculoskeletal 
um, application process, which is only a part of what osteopathy was originally intended to do. I, my recommendation for anybody that would ever care about my opinion would be if you're going to try to regulate osteopathy and it's currently unregulated, do it as self-regulation where you maintain control. The osteopaths maintain control of what can be done, how it can be done, what the scope of practice is. Because when the government gets involved, they very quickly, because of politics and other practitioners doing other types of things, they very quickly tighten the box down as to what a person is allowed to do and what a person is not allowed to do. I understand there's pros and there's cons of being regulated and not regulated, but it's really a double-edged sword. And people in the future need to be very careful that they don't destroy themselves, destroy their professions by asking to be accepted through a regulatory process. Yeah, I see. Thank you very much, uh, Todd. We would like to give you this um, little plaque. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, and you. Um, you become like a member of the, the Amigos del Instituto. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.